chapter fourteen of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen while gorgias was examining the subterranean chambers in the temple of isis charmian returned to lochias earlier than she herself had expected she had met her brother whom she did not find at canopus at berenike's and after greeting dion on his couch of pain she told archibius of her anxiety she confided to him alone that the queen had committed barine's fate to alexis for the news might easily have led the mother of the endangered woman to some desperate venture but even archibius's composure so difficult to disturb was not proof against it he would have sought the queen's presence at once if necessary forced his way to it but the historian timogenes who had just come from rome was expecting him and he had not returned to his birthplace as a private citizen but commissioned by octavianus to act as mediator in putting an end to the struggle which had really been decided in his favour at the battle of actium the choice of this mediator was a happy one for he had taught cleopatra in her childhood and was the self-same quick-witted man who had so often roused her to argument his share in a popular insurrection against the roman rule had led to his being carried as a slave to the tiber there he soon purchased his freedom and attained such distinction that octavianus entrusted this important mission to the man who was so well known in alexandria archibius was to meet him at the house of arius who was still suffering from the wounds inflicted by the chariot wheels of antyllus and berenike had accompanied timogenes to her brother charmian did not venture to go there a visit to octavianus's former teacher would have been misinterpreted and it was repugnant to her own delicacy of feeling to hold intercourse at this time with the foe and conqueror of her royal mistress she therefore let her brother drive with berenike to the injured man's but before his departure archibius had promised if the worst came to dare everything to open the eyes of the queen who had forbidden her charmian to speak in behalf of barine and thwart the plans of alexis from the paneum garden she was carried to the canopic way and the jewish quarter where she had many important purchases to make for cleopatra it was long after noon when the litter was again borne to lochias on the way she had severely felt her own powerlessness without having accomplished anything herself she was forced to wait for the success of others and she had scarcely crossed the threshold of the palace ere fresh cares were added to those which already burdened her soul she understood how to read the faces of courtiers and the doorkeepers had taught her that since her departure something momentous had occurred she disliked to question the slaves and lower officials so she refrained though the interior of the palace was crowded with guards officials of every grade attendants and slaves many who saw her gazed at her with the timidity inspired by those over whom some disaster is impending others whose relations were more intimate pressed forward to enjoy the mournful satisfaction of being the first messengers of evil tidings but she passed swiftly on keeping them back with grave words and gestures until before the door of the great ante-room thronged with greek and egyptian petitioners she met zeno the keeper of the seal charmian stopped him and inquired what had happened since when asked the old courtier every moment has brought some fresh tidings and all are mournful what terrible times charmian what disasters no messenger had arrived when i left the lochias replied charmian now it seems as though the old monster of a palace accustomed to so many horrors is holding its breath in dread tell me the main thing at least before i meet the queen the main thing pestilence or famine which shall we call the worse quick zeno i am expected 
i too am in haste and really there is nothing to relate over which the tongue would care to dwell candidus arrived first came himself straight from actium the fellow is bold enough is the army defeated also defeated dispersed deserted to the foe king herod with his legions in the van charmian covered her face with her hands and groaned aloud but zeno continued you were with her in the flight when mark antony left you he sailed with the ships which joined him for paratonium a large body of troops on which the queen and mardian had fixed their hopes was encamped there reinforcements could easily be gained and we should once more have a fine army at our disposal panarius scarpus a cautious soldier was in command and i too believed the more you trusted him the greater would be your error the shameless rascal he owes everything to antony had received tidings of actium ere the ships arrived and had already made overtures to octavianus when the imperator came the veterans who opposed the treachery were hewn down by the wretch's orders but the brave garrison of the city could not be won over to the monstrous crime it is due to these men that mark antony still lives and did not come to a miserable end at the hands of his own troops the twice defeated general a courier brought the news will arrive to-night strangely enough he will not come to lochias but to the little palace on the coma poor poor queen cried charmian how did she bear all this in the presence of the defeated candidus and antony's messenger like a heroine but afterwards her raving did not last long but the mute despairing silence ere she had fully recovered her self-command she sent us all away and i have not seen her since but all the thoughts and feelings which dwell here he pointed to his brow and breast have left their abode and linger with her i totter from place to place like a soulless body o oh, charmian what has befallen us where are the days when care and trouble lay buried with the other dead the days and nights when my brain united with that of the queen to transform this desolate earth into the beautiful elysian fields every day life to a festival festivals to the very air of olympus what unprecedented scenes of splendour had i not devised for the celebration of the victory the triumph nay even the entry into rome whole chests are filled with the sketches programmes drawings and verses all who handle brush and chisel compose and execute music would have lent their aid and you may believe me the result would have been something which future generations would have discussed lauded and extolled in song and now 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 we will double our efforts to save what is yet to be rescued rescued repeated the courtier in a hollow tone the queen too still clings to this fine word when i saw her at work yesterday it seemed as if i beheld her drawing water with the bottomless vessel of the deniades true to-day when i left her her arms had fallen and in this attitude she now stands before me with her tearful eyes and besides i can't get my nephew dion out of my mind cares nothing but cares concerning him and my intentions towards him were so kind my will gives him my entire fortune but now he actually wants to marry the singer the daughter of the artist leonax you have taken her under your protection but surely your own niece iris is dearer to you so you will approve of my destroying the will if dion insists upon his own way he shall not have a solidus of my property if he does not give up the woman who is a thorn in the queen's flesh and his choice does not suit our ancient race iris on the contrary was dion's playfellow and i have long destined her for his wife no better match nor one more acceptable to the queen could be found for him he cared for her until the singer bewitched him bring them together and they shall be like my own children if the fool resists his uncle whose sole desire is to benefit him i will withdraw my aid whatever intrigues his foes may weave i shall fold my arms and not interfere i stand in the place of his father my dead brother and demand obedience the queen is my universe and her favour is of more value than twenty refractory nephews 
you will retain her majesty's favour even if you intercede for your brother's son and iris when she finds herself deceived and she will soon discover it she will not rest until she has brought ruin upon him interrupted charmian in a tone of sorrow rather than reproach as though she already beheld the impending disaster but iris has no greater influence with the queen than i and if you and i unite to protect the brave young fellow who is of your own blood then of course no doubt on account of your longer period of service you have more influence with her majesty than iris however such matters must be considered and i have already said my mind leaves its abode to follow the queen like her shadow it heeds only what concerns her let everything else go as it will the fleet the same as destroyed candidus defeated herod a deserter treason on treason the african legions lost what in the name of the god who tried to roll back the wheel dashing down the mountain-side and yet let us offer sacrifices my friend and hope for better days zeno retired as he spoke but charmian moved forward with a drooping head to find barine and her faithful anukis and weep her fill ere she went to perform the duty of consoling and sustaining her beloved mistress yet she herself so sorely needed comfort wherever she turned her eyes she beheld disaster peril treachery and base intrigues she felt as if she had lived long enough and that her day was over hitherto her gentle nature her intellect which yearned to expand gather her new riches and exchange what it had gained with others had possessed much to offer to the queen she had not only been cleopatra's confidante but necessary to her to discuss questions far in advance of the demands of the times which occupied her restless mind now the queen's attention was wholly absorbed by events hard cruel facts which she must resist or turn to her own advantage her life had become a conflict and charmian felt that she was by no means combative the hard supple keenly polished intellect of iris now asserted its value and the elderly woman told herself that she was in danger of being held in less regard than her younger companion to resign her office would have given her peace of mind but she repelled the thought for the very reason that these days were so full of misery and perhaps drawing nearer to the end she must remain first for the sake of the queen but also to watch over barine now she longed to go to cleopatra her mere presence she knew would do her sore heart good the silvery laugh of a child reached her ears through the open gate of the garden which she was rapidly approaching little six-year-old alexander ran towards her with open arms hugged her closely pressed his curly head against her and gazed into her face with his large clear eyes charmian's heart swelled and as she raised the child in her arms and kissed him she thought of the sad fate impending and the composure maintained with so much difficulty gave way tears streamed from her eyes and sobbing violently she pressed the boy closer to her breast the prince accustomed to bright faces and tender caresses broke away from her in terror to run back to his brother and sisters but he had a kind little heart and knowing that no one weeps and sobs unless in pain alexander pitied charmian whom he loved and hurried to her again what he meant to show her had pleased his mother too and dried the tears in her eyes so he took charmian by the hand and drew her along saying that he wanted her to see the prettiest thing she willingly allowed herself to be led over the path strewn with red sand of the little garden which antony had had laid out for his children in the magnificent style which pleased his love of splendour and filled with rare and beautiful things there was a pond with tiny gold and silver fish where the rare lotus flowers with pink blossoms arose from amid their smooth green leaves and another where dwarf ducks of every colour which seemed as if they had been created for children swam to and fro a bit of the sea which washed its shore had been enclosed by a gilded lattice-work and on its surface floated a number of snow-white swans and black ones with scarlet bills native and indian 
flowers of every hue adorned the beds and the narrow paths were shaded by arbours made of gold wire over which ran climbing vines filled with bright blossoms a grotto of stalactites behind the dense foliage of an indian tree offered a resting-place and beside it was a little house where the children could stay the interior lacked none of the requisites of living not even the cooking utensils in the kitchen and the family portraits in the tablinum delicately painted by an artist on small ivory slabs everything was made to suit the size of children but of the most costly material and careful workmanship behind the house was a little stable where four tiny horses with spotted skins the rarest and prettiest creatures imaginable a gift from the king of medea were stamping the ground in another place was an enclosure containing gazelles ostriches young giraffes and other grass-eating animals bright plumaged birds and monkeys filled the tops of the trees gay balls rose and fell on the jets of the fountains and child genii and images of the gods and bronze and marble peered from the foliage this whole enchanted world was comprised within a narrow space and with its radiance of colour and wealth of form its perfumed songs and warbling exerted a bewildering influence upon the excited imaginations of grown people as well as children little alexander without even casting a glance at all this drew charmian forward he did not pause until he reached the shore of the lotus pond then putting his fingers on his lips he said there now i'll show you look here rising cautiously upon tiptoe as he spoke he pointed to the hollow in the trunk of a tree a pair of finches had built their nest in it and five young ones with big yellow beaks stretched their ugly little heads hungrily upward that's so pretty cried the prince and you must see the old ones come to feed them the beautiful boy's sweet face fairly beamed with delight and charmian kissed him tenderly yet even as she did so she thought of the young swallows hacked to death in his mother's galley and a chill ran through her veins just at that moment voices were heard calling alexander from a neglected spot behind the dainty little house built for the children and the boy exclaimed peevishly there now i showed you the little nest so i forgot agatha fell asleep and smyrtis went away so we were alone then they sent me to horace the gatekeeper to get some of his spelt bread he never says no to anything and it does taste so good we're peasants and have been using the axe and the hoe so we want something to eat have you seen our house we built it ourselves selene helios yotape my future wife and i yes i they let me help and we finished it alone all alone everything is here we shall build the shed for the cow to-morrow the others mustn't see it but i may show it to you while speaking he drew her forward again and charmian obediently followed the twins and little yotape who had been chosen for the future bride of the six-year-old prince alexander a pretty delicate fair-haired child of his own age the daughter of the median king who had been betrothed to the boy after the parthian war and now remained as a hostage at cleopatra's court welcomed her with joyous shouts with the exception of the little median princess charmian had witnessed their birth and they all loved her dearly the little royal labourers showed their work with proud delight and it really was well done they had toiled at it for weeks paying no heed to the garden and all its costly rarities they pointed with special pride to the two planks which helios aided by alexander had fished out of the sea after the last storm when they were left alone and to the lock on the door which they had secretly managed to wrench from an old gate selene herself had woven the curtain in front of the door now they were going to build a hearth too charmian praised their skill while they all talking merrily together told her how they had conquered the greatest difficulties their bright eyes sparkled with pleasure while describing the work of their own hands and they were so absorbed in eager delight that they did not notice the approach of a man until startled by his words enough of this idle sport now your highnesses too much time has already been wasted on it 
then turning to the queen who had accompanied him he continued in a tone of apology this amusement might seem somewhat hazardous yet there is much to be said in his favour besides it appeared to afford the royal children so much pleasure that i permitted it for a short time but if your majesty commands let them have their pleasure the queen interrupted kindly and as soon as the children saw their mother they rushed forward crowded around her with fearless love thanked her and eagerly assured her that nothing in the whole garden was half so dear to them as their little house they meant to build a stable too that might be too much said the tutor euphronion a grey-haired man with a shrewd kindly face we must remember how many things are yet to be learned that we may reach the goal fixed for your majesty's birthday and pass the examination but all the children now joined in the entreaty to be allowed to build the stable too and it was granted when the tutor at last began to lead them away the royal mother stopped them asking suppose instead of this garden i should give you a bit of bare land such as the peasants till where after your lessons you might dig and build as much as you please loud shouts of joy from the children answered the question but the little median girl yotape said hesitatingly could i take my doll too only the oldest atossa she has lost one arm yet i love her the best deprive us of anything you choose cried helios drawing a little alexander towards him to show that they the men were of the same mind only give us some ground and let us build we will consider whether it can be done replied cleopatra perhaps euphronion you would be the right person but we will discuss the matter at a more quiet hour the tutor withdrew and the children who followed looked back waving their hands and calling to their mother for a long time when they had disappeared behind the shrubbery in the garden charmian exclaimed however dark the sky may be so long as you possess these little ones you can never lack sunshine if replied cleopatra gazing pensively at the ground with a thought of them another did not blend which makes the gloom become deeper still you know the tidings this terrible day has brought all replied charmian sighing heavily then you know the abyss on whose verge we are walking and to see them them also dragged into the yawning gulf by their unhappy mother oh charmian charmian she sobbed aloud threw her arms around the neck of her friend and playfellow and laid her head upon her bosom like a child seeking consolation cleopatra wept for several minutes and when she again raised her tear-stained face she said softly that did me good o oh charmian no one needs love as i do on your warm heart my own has already grown calmer use it nestle there whenever you need it to the end cried charmian deeply moved to the end repeated cleopatra wiping her eyes it began to-day i think i have just spent an hour alone i meant to commit a crime and you know how impatiently passion sweeps me along but what misfortunes have assailed me the army destroyed the desertion of herod and Pinarius, antony's generous trusting heart torn by base treachery his soul darkened the reconstruction of the canal the last hope gorgias brought the news the same as destroyed just then little alexander came to show me his bird's nest everything else in the garden seemed to him worthless by comparison this awakened new thoughts and now here is the little house which the children have built with their own hands all these things forced me by some mysterious power to look back along the course of my life to the distant days in your father's house i these children upon what different foundations our lives have been built i made them begin at the point i gained when youth lay behind me my childhood commenced among the disorders of the government clouded by my father's exile and my mother's death on the brink of ruin that of the twins they are ten years old will soon be over and now after enjoying pleasures not one of which was bestowed on me they must endure the same sorrow but did not we have better ones what they daily possessed we only dreamed of in our simple garden 
how often i let you share the radiant visions which my soul revealed to me you willingly accompanied me into the splendid fairy world of my dreams all that my imagination conjured up during the years of quiet and repose accompanied me into my after-life again and again i have beheld them rich and powerful upon the throne the means of rendering the vision a verity were at hand and when i met the man whose own life resembled the realization of a dream i recalled those childish fancies and made them facts the marvels with which i adorned my lover's existence were childish dreams to which i gave tangible form this garden is an image of the life to which i intended to rise in reality fell we collected within the limits of this bit of earth everything which can delight the senses not a single one is omitted in this narrow space whose crowded maze of pleasures fairly impede freedom of movement yet in your home and guided by your wise father i had learned to be content with so little and commenced the struggle to attain peace that painless peace our chief good whence came it through me it was lost to you both but the children i made them begin their lives in an arena of every disturbing influence and now i see how their own healthy natures yearn to escape from the dazzling wealth of colour the stupefying fragrance the bewildering songs and twittering they longed to return to the untilled earth where the life of struggling mortals began the boy casts away the baubles to test his own creative powers the girl follows his example and clings fast only to the doll in which she sees the living child in order to do justice to the maternal instinct the token of her sex but what they so eagerly desire is right and shall be granted when i was ten years old like the twins my life and efforts were already directed towards one fixed goal they are still blindly following the objects set before them let them return to the place whence their mother started where she received everything good which is still hers they shall go to the garden of epicurus no matter whether it is the old one in canopus or elsewhere all that their mother beheld in vivid dreams which she often strove with wanton extravagance to realize has surrounded them from their birth and early satiated them when they enter life they will scorn what merely stirs and dazzles the senses and cling to the aspiration for painless peace of mind if a wise guide directs them and protects them from the dangers which the teachings of epicurus contain for youth i have found this guide and you too will trust him i mean your brother archibius archibius asked charmian in surprise yes he who grew up in the garden of epicurus and in life and philosophy found the support which has preserved his peace of mind during all the conflicts of existence he who loves the mother and to whom the children are also dear he to whom the boys and girls cling with affectionate confidence i wish to place the children under his protection and if he will consent to grant this desire of the most hapless of women i shall look forward calmly to the end it is approaching i feel i know it gorgias is already at work upon the plan for my tomb oh my queen cried charmian sorrowfully whatever may happen your illustrious life cannot be in danger the generous heart of mark antony does not throb in octavianus's breast but he is not cruel and for the very reason that cool calculation curbs ambition he will spare you he knows that you are the idol of the city the whole country and if he really succeeds in adding fresh victories to this first conquest if the immortals permit your throne and may they avert it your sacred person too to fall into his power then cried cleopatra her clear eyes flashing then he shall learn which of us two is the greater then i shall know how to maintain the right to despise him though blind fate should make the whole power of the world subject to him who robbed my son and caesars of his heritage her eyes had blazed with anger as she uttered the words then letting her little clenched hand fall she went on in an altered tone months may pass before he is strong enough to risk the attack and the immortals themselves approve the erection of the monument the only obstacle in the way the house of the old philosopher didymus was destroyed 
a messenger from gorgias brought the news it is to be the second monument in alexandria worthy of notice the other contains the body of the great alexander to whom the city owes its origin and name he who subjected half the world to his power and the genius of the greeks was younger than i when he died whence do i by whose miserable weakness the battle of actium was lost derive the right to walk longer beneath the sun perhaps mark antony will arrive in a few hours and will you meet the disheartened hero in this mood interrupted charmian he does not wish to be received answered cleopatra bitterly he even refused to let me greet him and i understand the denial but what must have overwhelmed this joyous nature so friendly to all mankind that he longs for solitude and avoids meeting those who are nearest and dearest iris is now at the coma whither he wishes to retire to see that everything is in order she will also provide a supply of the flowers he loves it is hard cruelly hard not to welcome him as usual o oh, charmian what joy it was when with open arms and overflowing heart he swung his mighty figure ashore like a youth while his handsome heroic face beamed with ardent love for me and then you do not forget it either when he raised his deep voice to shout the first greeting why it seemed as if the very fish in the water must join in and the palm trees on the shore waved their feathery tops in joyous sympathy and here the dreams of my childhood which i made reality for him received us and our existence wreathed with love and roses became a fairy tale since the day he rode towards us at canopus and offered me the first bouquet with his sunny glance wooing my love his image has stood before my soul as the embodiment of the virile strength which conquers everything and the bright undimmed joy which renders the whole world happy and now now do you remember the dull dreamer whom we left ere he set forth for peritoneum but no no a thousand times no he must not remain so not with bowed head but erect as in the days of happiness must he cross the threshold of hades hand in hand with her whom he loved and he does love me still else would he have followed me hither though no magic goblet drew him after me and i the heart which in the breast of the child gave him its first young love is still his and will be for ever might i not go to the harbour and await him there look me in the face charmian and answer me as fearlessly as a mirror did olympus really succeed in effacing the wrinkles they were scarcely visible before was the reply and even the keenest eye could no longer discover them i have brought the pomade too and the prescription olympus gave me for hush hush interrupted cleopatra softly there are many living creatures in this garden and they say that even the birds are good listeners a roguish smile deepened the dimples in her cheeks as she spoke and delight in her bewitching grace forced from charmian's lips the exclamation if mark antony could only see you now flatterer replied the queen with a grateful smile but charmian felt that the time had now come to plead once more for barine and she began eagerly no i certainly do not flatter no one in alexandria no matter what name she bears could venture to vie even remotely with your charms so cease the persecution of the unfortunate woman whom you confided to my care it is an insult to cleopatra but here an indignant again interrupted her cleopatra's face which during the conversation had mirrored every emotion of a woman's soul from the deepest sorrow to the most mischievous mirth assumed an expression of repellent harshness and with a curt remark you are forgetting what i had good reason to forbid i must go to my work she turned her back upon the companion of her youth End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen charmian went towards her own apartments how often she had had a similar experience in the midst of the warmest admiration for this rare woman's depth of feeling 
masculine strength of intellect tireless industry watchful care for her native land steadfast loyalty and maternal devotion she had been sobered in the most pitiable way she had been forced to see cleopatra for the sake of realizing a childish dream and impressing her lover squander vast sums which diminish the prosperity of her subjects place great and important matters below the vain punctilious care of her own person forget in petty jealousy the justice and kindness which were marked traits in her character and though the most kindly and womanly of sovereigns suffer herself to be urged by angry excitement to inflict outrage on a subject whose acts had awakened her displeasure the lofty ambition which had inspired her noblest and most praiseworthy deeds had more than once been the source of acts which she herself regretted when a child she could not endure to be surpassed in difficult tasks and still deemed it a necessity to be first and peerless hence the unfortunate circumstance that antony had given barine the counterpart of an armlet which she herself wore as a gift from her lover was perhaps the principal cause of her bitter resentment against the hapless woman charmian had seen cleopatra forgive freely and generously many a wrong nay many an affront inflicted upon her but to see herself placed by her husband on the same plane as a barine even in the most trivial matter might easily seem to her an unbearable insult and the mishap which had befallen caesarion in consequence of his foolish passion for the young beauty gave her a right to punish her rival deeply anxious concerning the fate of the woman in her care greatly agitated moreover and exhausted physically and mentally charmian sought her own apartments here she hoped to find solace in barine's cheerful and equable nature here the helpful hands of her dark-skinned maid and confidant awaited her the sun was low in the western horizon when she entered the ante-room the members of the bodyguard who were on duty told her that nothing unusual had occurred and with a sigh of relief she passed into the sitting-room but the ethiopian who usually came to meet her with words of welcome took her veil and wraps and removed her shoes was absent to-day no one greeted her not until she entered the second room which she had assigned to her guest did she find barine who was weeping bitterly during charmian's absence the latter had received a letter from alexis in which he informed her that he was ordered by the queen to subject her to an examination the next morning her cause looked dark but if she did not render his duty harder by the harshness which had formerly caused him much pain he would do his utmost to protect her from imprisonment forced labour in the mines or even worse misfortunes the imprudent game which she had played with king caesarion had unfortunately roused the people against her the depth of their indignation was shown by the fury with which they had assailed the house of her grandfather didymus nothing could save dion who had audaciously attacked the illustrious son of their beloved queen from the rage of the populace he alexis knew that in this dion she would lose a friend and protector but he would be disposed to take his place if her conduct did not render it impossible for him to unite mercy with justice this shameful letter which promised barine clemency in return for her favour without unmasking him in his character of judge explained to charmian the agitation in which she found her friend's daughter it was doubtless a little relief to barine to express her loathing and abhorrence of alexis as eagerly as her gentle nature would permit but fear grief and indignation continued to struggle for the mastery in her oppressed soul it would have been expected that the keen-witted woman would have eagerly inquired what charmian had accomplished with the queen and archibius and what new events had happened to affect cleopatra the state and the city 
but she questioned her with far deeper interest concerning the welfare of her lover desiring information in regard to many things of which her friend could give no tidings in her brief visit to dion's couch she had not learned how he bore his own misfortunes and marines what view he took of the future or what he expected from the woman he loved charmian's ignorance and silence in regard to these very matters increased the anxiety of the endangered woman who saw not only her own life but those dearest to her seriously threatened so she entreated her hostess to relieve her from the uncertainty which was harder to endure than the most terrible reality but the latter either could not or would not give her any further details of cleopatra's intentions or the fate and present abode of her grandparents and helena this increased her anxiety for if alexis's information was correct her family must be homeless when charmian at last admitted that she had seen dion only a few minutes the tortured barine's power of quiet endurance gave way she whose nature was so hopeful that when the glow of the sunset faded she already anticipated with delight the rosy dawn of the next day now beheld in cleopatra's hand the reed which was to sign the death sentence of dion and herself her mental vision conjured up her relatives wounded by the falling house or bleeding under the stones hurled by the raging populace she heard alexis command the executioner to subject her to the rack and fancied that anukis had not returned because she had failed to find dion the queen's soldiers had probably carried him to prison loaded with chains if philostratus had not already instigated the mob to drag him through the streets with feverish impetuosity which alarmed charmian the more because it was so unlike her old friend's daughter barine described all the spectres with which her imagination agitated by terror longing love and loathing terrified her but the former exerted all the power of eloquence she possessed by turns reproving her and loading her with caresses in order to soothe her and rouse her from her despair but nothing availed at last she succeeded in persuading the unhappy woman to go with her to the window which afforded a most beautiful view westward beyond the heptastadium the sun was sinking below the forests of masts in the harbour of the eunostus and charmian who had learned from her intercourse with the royal children how to soothe a troubled young heart to divert barine's thoughts directed her attention to the crimson glow in the western sky and told her how her father the artist had showed her the superb brilliancy which colours gained at this hour of the day even when the west was less radiant than now but barine who usually could never gaze at her fill at such a spectacle did not thank her for this sunset reminded her of another which she had lately watched at dion's side and she again broke into convulsive sobs charmian not knowing what to do passed her arm around her just at that moment the door was hurriedly thrown open and anukis the nubian entered her mistress knew that something unusual must have happened to detain her so long from her post at barine's side and her appearance showed that she had been attending to important matters which had severely taxed her strength her shining dark skin looked ashen grey her high forehead surrounded by tangled woolly locks was dripping with perspiration and her thick lips were pale although she must have undergone great fatigue she did not seem in need of rest for after greeting the ladies apologizing for her long absence and telling barine that this time dion had seemed to her half on the way to recovery a rapid side glance at her mistress conveyed an entreaty that she would follow her into the next room but the language of the nubian's eyes had not escaped the suspicious watchfulness of the anxious barine and overwhelmed with fresh terror she begged that she might hear all 
charmian ordered her maid to speak openly but anukis ere she began assured them that she had received the news she brought from a most trustworthy source only it would make a heavy demand upon the resolution and courage of barine whom she had hoped to find in a very different mood there was no time to lose she was expected at the appointed place an hour after sunset here charmian interrupted the maid with the exclamation impossible and reminded her of the guards which alexis aided by iris who was thoroughly familiar with the palace had stationed the day before in the ante-room at all the doors nay even beneath the windows the nubian replied that everything had been considered but to gain time she must beg barine to let her colour her skin and curl her hair while she was talking the surprise visible in the young beauty's face caused her to exclaim only act with entire confidence you shall learn everything directly there is so much to tell on the way here i had planned how to relate the whole story in regular order but it can't be done now no no whoever wants to save a flock of sheep from a burning shed must lead out the bell weather first the main thing i mean so i will begin with that though it really comes last the explanation of how all this here like a cry of joy barine's exclamation interrupted her i am to fly and dion knows it and will follow me i see it in your face in fact every feature of the dusky maid-servant's ugly face betrayed that pleasant thoughts were agitating her mind her black eyes flashed with fearless daring and a smile beautified her big mouth and thick lips as she replied a loving heart like yours understands the art of prophecy better than the chief priest of the great serapis yes my young mistress he of whom you speak must disappear from this wicked city where so much evil threatens you both he will certainly escape and if the immortals aid us and we are wise and brave you also whence the help comes can be told later now the first thing is to transform you don't be reluctant into the ugliest woman in the world black anukis you must escape from the palace in this disguise now you know the whole plan and while i get what is necessary from my chest of clothes i beg you mistress to consider how we are to obtain the black stains for that ivory skin and golden hair with these words she left the room but barine flung herself into her friend's arms exclaiming amid tears and laughter though i should be forced to remain for ever as black and crooked as faithful isopian if he did not withdraw his love though i were obliged to go through fire and water i would o oh charmian what changes so quickly as joy and sorrow i would fain show some kindness to every one in the world even to your queen who has brought all these troubles upon me the new-born hope had transformed the despairing woman into a happy one and charmian perceived it with grateful joy secretly wishing that cleopatra had listened to her appeal while examining the hair dyes used by the queen she saw lurking in the background of what was still unexplained and therefore confused her mind fresh and serious perils barine on the contrary gazed across them to the anticipated meeting with her lover and was full of the gayest expectation until the maid-servant's return the work of disfigurement began without delay anukis moved her lips as busily as her hands and described in regular order all that had befallen her during the eventful day barine listened with rising excitement and her joy increased as she beheld the path which had been smoothed for her by the care and wisdom of her friends charmian on the contrary became graver and more quiet the more distinctly she perceived the danger her favourite must encounter yet she could not help admitting that it would be a sin against barine's safety perhaps her very life to withhold her from this well-considered plan of escape that it must be tried was certain but as the moment which was to endanger the woman she loved drew nearer and she could not help saying to herself that she was aiding an enterprise in opposition to the express command of the queen and helping to execute a plan which threatened to rouse the indignation perhaps the fury of cleopatra a feeling of sorrow overpowered her she feared nothing for herself not for a single instant did she think of the unpleasant consequences which barine's escape might draw upon her the burden on her soul was due only to the consciousness of having for the first time opposed the will of the sovereign 
to fulfil whose desires and to promote whose aims had been the beloved duty of her life doubtless the thought crossed her mind that by aiding barine's escape she was guarding cleopatra from future repentance probably she felt sure that it was her duty to help rescue this beautiful young life whose bloom had been so cruelly assailed by tempest and hoar-frost and which now had a prospect of the purest happiness yet though in itself commendable the deed brought her into sharp conflict with the loftiest aims and aspirations of her life and how much nearer than the other was the woman she shrank from the word whom she was about to betray how much greater was cleopatra's claim to her love and gratitude could she have any other emotion than thankfulness if the plan of escape succeeded yet she was reluctant to perform the task of making barine's beautiful symmetrical figure resemble the hunchbacked nubians or to dip her fingers into the pomade intended for cleopatra and it grieved her to mar the beauty of barine's luxuriant tresses by cutting off part of her thick fair braids true these things could not be avoided if the flight was to succeed and the further anukis advanced in her story the fewer became her mistress's objections to the plan the conversation between iris and alexis which had been overheard by the maid already made it appear necessary to withdraw barine and her lover from the power of such foes the faithful man whom anukis had found with dion whose name she did not mention and of whose home she said only that no safer hiding-place could be found even by the mole which burrowed in the earth really seemed to have been sent with gorgias to dion's couch by fate itself the control of the subterranean chambers in the temple of isis which had been bestowed on the architect also appeared like a miracle upon a small tablet which the wise isopian had intentionally delayed handing to her mistress until now were the lines archibius greets his sister charmian if i know your heart it will be as hard for you as for me to share this plot yet it must be done for the sake of her father to save the life and happiness of his child so it must fall to your lot to bring barine to the temple of isis at the corner of the muses she will find her lover there and if possible be wedded to him as the sanctuary is so near you need leave the palace only a short time do not tell barine what we have planned the disappointment would be too great if it should prove impracticable this letter and the arrangement it proposed transformed the serious scruples which shadowed charmian's good will into a joyous nay enthusiastic desire to render assistance barine's marriage to the man who possessed her heart was close at hand and she was the daughter of leonax who had once been dear to her fear and doubt vanished as if scattered to the four winds and when isopian's work of transformation was completed and barine stood before her as the high-shouldered dark-visaged wrinkled maid she could not help admitting that it would be easy to escape from the palace in that disguise she now told barine that she intended to accompany her herself and though the former's stained face forced her to refrain from kissing her friend she plainly expressed to her and the faithful freedwoman the overflowing gratitude which filled her heart anukis was left alone after carefully removing all the traces of her occupation as habit dictated she raised her arms in prayer beseeching the gods of her native land to protect the beautiful woman to whom she had loaned her own misshapen form which had now been of genuine service and who had gone forth to meet so many dangers but also a happiness whose very hope had been denied to her charmian had told her maid that if the queen should inquire for her before iris returned from the coma to say that she had been obliged to leave the palace and to supply her place during their absence when charmian had been attacked by sickness cleopatra had often entrusted the care of her toilet to isopian and had praised her skill the queen's confidential attendant was followed as usual when she went out by a dark-skinned maid lanterns and lamps had already been lighted in the corridors of the spacious palace and the courtyards were ablaze with torches and pitch-pans but brilliantly as they burned in many places and numerous as were the guards officers eunuchs clerks soldiers cooks attendants slaves 
doorkeepers and messengers whom they passed not one gave them more than a careless glance so they reached the last courtyard and then came a moment when the hearts of both women seemed to stop beating for the man whom they had most cause to dread alexis the syrian approached and he did not pass the fugitives but stopped charmian and courteously even obsequiously informed her that he wished to get rid of the troublesome affair of her favourite which had been assigned to him against his will and therefore had determined to bring barine to trial early the following morning the syrian's body servant attended his master and while the former was talking with charmian the latter turned to the supposed nubian tapped her lightly on the shoulder and whispered come this evening as you did yesterday you haven't finished the story of prince set now the fugitive felt as if she had grown dumb and could never more regain the power of speech yet she managed to nod and directly after the favourite bowed a farewell to charmian the ligurian was obliged to follow his master while charmian and barine passed through the gateway between the last pylons into the open air here the sea breeze seemed to waft her a joyous greeting from the realm of liberty and happiness and the timid woman amid all the perils which surrounded her regained sufficient presence of mind to tell her friend what alexis's slave had whispered that isopion might remind him of it the same evening and thus strengthen his belief that the nubian had accompanied the queen's confidant the way to the temple of isis was short the stars showed that they would reach their destination in time but a second delay unexpectedly occurred from the steps leading to the cella of the sanctuary a procession whose length seemed endless came towards them at the head of the train marched eight pastophori bearing the image of isis then came the basket-bearers of the goddess with several other priestesses followed by the reader with an open book-roll behind him appeared the quaternary number of prophets whose head the chief priest moved with stately dignity beneath a canopy the rest of the priestly train bore in their hands manuscripts sacred vessels standards and wreaths the priestesses some of whom with garlands on their flowing hair were already shaking the sistrum of isis mingled with the line of priests their high voices blending with the deep notes of the men neocori or temple servants and a large number of worshippers of isis closed the procession all wearing wreaths and carrying flowers torch and lantern-bearers lighted the way and the perfume of the incense rising from the little pan of charcoal in the hand of a bronze arm which the pastophori waved to and fro surrounded and floated after the procession the two women waiting for the train to pass saw it turn towards lochias and the conversation of the bystanders informed them that its object was to convey to the new isis the queen the greeting of the goddess and assure the sovereign of the divinity's remembrance of her in the hour of peril cleopatra could not help accepting this friendly homage and it was incumbent upon her to receive it wearing on her head the crown of upper and lower egypt and robed in all the ecclesiastical vestments which only her two most trusted attendants knew how to put on with the attention to details that custom required this had never been entrusted to maids of inferior position like the nubian so cleopatra would miss charmian the thought filled her with fresh uneasiness and when the steps were at last free she asked herself anxiously how all this would end it seemed as if the fugitive and her companion had exposed themselves to this great peril in vain for some of the temple servants were forcing back those who wished to enter the sanctuary shouting that it would be closed until the return of the procession barine gazed timidly into charmian's face but ere she could express her opinion the tall figure of a man appeared on the temple steps it was archibius who with grave composure bade them follow him and silently led them around the sanctuary to a side door through which a short time before a litter had passed accompanied by several attendants ascending a flight of steps within the long building they reached the dimly lighted cella as in the temple of osiris at abydus seven quarters here three led to the same number of apartments the holy place of the sanctuary the central one was dedicated to isis 
that on the left to her husband osiris and that on the right to horus the son of the great goddess before it scarcely visible in the dim light stood the altars loaded with sacrifices by archibius beside that of horus was the litter which had been borne into the temple before the arrival of the women from it supported by two friends descended a slender young man a hollow sound echoed through the pillared hall the iron door at the main entrance of the temple had been closed the shrill rattle that followed proceeded from the metal bolts which an old servant of the sanctuary had shot into the sockets barine started but neither inquired the cause of the noise nor perceived the wealth of objects here presented to the senses for the man who leaning on another's arm approached the altar was dion the lover who had perilled his life for her sake her eyes rested intently on his figure her whole heart yearned towards him and unable to control herself she called his name aloud charmian gazed anxiously around the group but soon uttered a sigh of relief for the tall man whose arm supported dion was gorgias the worthy architect his best friend and the other still taller and stronger her own brother archibius yonder figure emerging from the disguise of wraps was berenike barine's mother all trustworthy confidants the only person whom she did not know was the handsome young man standing at her brother's side barine whose arm she still held had struggled to escape to rush to her mother and lover but archibius had approached and in a whisper warned her to be patient and to refrain from any greeting or question supposing he added that you are willing to be married at this altar to dion the son of eumenes charmian felt barine's arm tremble in hers at this suggestion but the young beauty obeyed her friend's directions she did not know what had befallen her or whether in the excess of happiness which overwhelmed her to shout aloud in her exultant joy or melt into silent tears of gratitude and emotion no one spoke archibius took a roll of manuscript from dion's hand presented himself before the assembled company as the bride's curios or guardian and asked barine whether she so recognized him then he returned to dion the marriage contract whose contents he knew and approved and informed those present that in the marriage about to be solemnized they must consider him the paranymphos or best man and berenike as the bridesmaid and they instantly lighted a torch at the fires burning on one of the altars archibius as curios joined the lovers hands in the egyptian barine's mother as bride made in the greek manner and dion gave his bride a plain iron ring it was the same one which his father had bestowed at his own wedding and he whispered my mother valued it now it is your turn to honour the ancient treasure after stating that the necessary sacrifices had been offered to isis and serapis zeus hera and artemis and that the marriage between dion son of eumenes and barine daughter of leonax was concluded archibius shook hands with both haste seemed necessary for he permitted berenike and his sister only time for a brief embrace and gorgias to clasp her hand in dion's then he beckoned and the newly made bride's mother followed him in tears charmian bewildered and almost stupefied she did not fully realize the meaning of the event she had just witnessed until an old neocori had guided her and the others into the open air barine felt as if every moment might rouse her from a blissful dream and yet she gladly told herself that she was awake for the man walking before her leaning on the arm of a friend was dion true she saw even in the faint light of the dim temple corridor that he was suffering walking appeared to be so difficult that she rejoiced when yielding to gorgias's entreaties he entered the litter but where were the bearers she was soon to learn for even while she looked for them the architect and the youth in whom she had long since recognized philotus her grandfather's assistant seized the poles follow us said gorgias under his breath and she obeyed keeping close behind the litter which was borne first down a broad and then a narrow staircase and finally along a passage here a door stopped the fugitives but the architect opened it and helped his friend out of the litter which before proceeding farther he placed in a room filled with various articles discovered during his investigation of the subterranean temple chambers 
hitherto not a word had been spoken now gorgias called to barine this passage is low you must stoop cover your head and don't be afraid if you meet bats they have long been undisturbed we might have taken you from the temple to the sea and waited there but it would probably have attracted attention and been dangerous courage young wife of dion the corridor is long and walking through it is difficult but compared with the road to the mines it is as smooth and easy as the street of the king if you think of your destination the bats will seem like the swallows which announce the approach of spring marine nodded gratefully to him but she kissed the hand of dion who was moving forward painfully leaning on the arm of his friend the light of the torch carried by gorgias's faithful foreman who led the way had fallen on her blackened arm and when the little party advanced she kept behind the others she thought it might be unpleasant for her lover to see her thus disfigured and spared him though she would gladly have remained nearer as soon as the passage grew lower the wounded man's friends took him in their arms and their task was a hard one for they were not only obliged to move onward bending low under the heavy burden but also to beat off the bats which frightened by the foreman's torch flew up in hosts marine's hair was covered it is true but at any other time the hideous creatures which often brushed against her head and arms would have filled her with horror and loathing now she scarcely heeded them her eyes were fixed on the recumbent figure in the bearer's arms the man to whom she belonged body and soul and whose patient suffering pierced her inmost heart his head rested on the breast of gorgias who walked directly in front of her the architect's stooping posture concealed his face but his feet were visible and whenever they twitched she fancied he was in pain then she longed to press forward to his side wipe the perspiration from his brow in the hot low corridor and whisper words of love and encouragement this she was sometimes permitted to do when the friends put down their heavy burden true they allowed themselves only brief intervals of rest but they were long enough to show her how the sufferer's strength was failing when they at last reached their destination philotus was forced to exert all his strength to support the exhausted man while gorgias cautiously opened the door it led to a flight of sea-washed steps close to the garden of didymus which as a child she had often used with her brother to float a little boat upon the water the architect opened the door only a short distance he was expected for barine soon heard him whisper and suddenly the door was flung wide a tall man raised dion and bore him into the open air while she was still gazing after him a second figure of equal size approached her and hastily begging her permission lifted her in his arms like a child and as she inhaled the cool night air and felt the water through which her bearer waded splash up and wet her feet her eyes sought her new-made husband but in vain the night was very dark and the lights on the shore did not reach this spot so far below the walls of the quay barine was frightened but a few minutes after the outlines of a large fishing boat loomed through the darkness dimly illumined by the harbour lights and the next instant the giant who carried her placed her on the deck and a deep voice whispered all's well i'll bring some wine at once then barine saw her husband lying motionless on a couch which had been prepared for him in the prow of the boat bending over him she perceived that he had fainted and while rubbing his forehead with the wine raising his head on her lap cheering him and afterwards by the light of a small lantern carefully renewing the bandage on his shoulder she did not notice that the vessel was moving through the water until the boatman set the triangular sail she had not been told where the boat was bearing her and she did not ask any spot that she could share with dion was welcome the more lonely the place the more she could be to him how her heart swelled with gratitude and love when she bent over him kissed his forehead and felt how feverishly it burned she thought i will nurse you back to health and raised her eyes and soul to her favourite god to whom she owed the gift of song and who understood everything beautiful and pure to thank phoebus apollo and beseech him to pour his rays the next morning on a convalescent man while she was still engaged in prayer the boat touched the shore again strong arms bore her and dion to the land and when her foot touched the solid earth her rescuer the freedman pyrrhus broke the silence saying welcome wife of dion to our island true you must be satisfied to take us as we are but if you are as content with us as we are glad to serve you and your lord who is ours also the hour of leave-taking will be far distant 
then leading the way to the house he showed her as her future apartments two large whitewashed rooms whose sole ornament was their exquisite neatness on the threshold stood pyrrhus's grey-haired wife a young woman and a girl scarcely beyond childhood but the older one modestly welcomed barine and also begged her to accept their hospitality recovery was rapid in the pure air of the serpent isle she herself and she pointed to the others her oldest son's wife and her own daughter dione would be ready to render her any service End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of cleopatra by gay org ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen brothers and sisters are rarely talkative when they are together as charmian went to lochias with archibius it was difficult for her to find words the events of the past few hours had agitated her so deeply archibius too could not succeed in turning his thoughts in any other direction though important and far more momentous things claimed his attention they walked on silently side by side in reply to his sister's inquiry where the newly wedded pair were to be concealed he had answered that spite of her trustworthiness this must remain a secret to her second query how had it been possible to use the interior of the temple of isis without interruption he also made a guarded reply in fact it was the control of the subterranean corridors of the sanctuary which had suggested to gorgias the idea of carrying dion through them to pyrrhus's fishing boat to accomplish this it was only necessary to have the temple of isis which usually remained open day and night left to the fugitives friends for a short time and this was successfully managed the historian timagenes who had come from rome as ambassador and claimed the hospitality of his former pupil archibius had been empowered to offer cleopatra recognition of her own and her children's right to the throne and a full pardon if she would deliver mark antony into the hands of octavianus or have him put to death the alexandrian timagenes considered this demand both just and desirable because it promised to deliver his native city from the man whose despotic arrogance menaced its freedom and whose lavish generosity and boundless love of splendour diminished its wealth to rome as whose representative the historian appeared this man's mere existence meant constant turmoil and civil war at the restoration of the flute player by gabinius and mark antony timagenes had been carried into slavery later when after his freedom had been purchased by the son of sulla he succeeded in attaining great influence in rome he still remained hostile to mark antony and it had been a welcome charge to work against him in alexandria he hoped to find an ally in archibius whose loyal devotion to the queen he knew arius barine's uncle and octavianus's former tutor would also aid him the most powerful support of his mission however could be rendered by the venerable chief priest the head of the whole egyptian hierarchy he had shown the latter that antony in any case was a lost man and egypt was in the act of dropping like a ripe fruit into the lap of octavianus it would soon be in his power to give the country whatever degree of liberty and independence he might choose the caesar had the sole disposal of the queen's fate also and whoever desired to see her remain on the throne must strive to gain the good will of octavianus the wise anubis had considered all these things but he owed to timagenes the hint that arius was the man whom octavianus most trusted so the august prelate secretly entered into communication with barine's uncle 
but the dignity of his high office and the feebleness of extreme age forbade anubis to seek the man who was suspected of friendship for the romans he had therefore sent his trusted secretary the young serapion to make a compact as his representative with the friend of octavianus whose severe injuries prevented his leaving the house to go to the chief priest during timagenes's negotiations with the secretary and arius archibius came to entreat barine's uncle to do everything in his power to save his niece and as all the queen's friends were anxious to prevent an act which in these times of excitement could not fail on account of its connection with dion a member of the council to rouse a large number of the citizens against her serapion as soon as he was made aware of the matter eagerly protested his readiness to do his best to save the imperiled lovers he cared nothing for barine or dion as individuals but he doubtless would have been ready to make a still greater sacrifice to win the influential archibius and especially arius who would have great power through octavianus the rising sun the men had just begun to discuss plans for saving barine when the nubian appeared and told archibius what had been arranged beside dion's sickbed by the freedman and gorgias the escape of the fugitives depended solely upon their reaching the boat unseen and the surest way to accomplish this was to use the subterranean passage which the architect had again opened archibius to whom the representative of the chief priest had offered his aid now took the others into his confidence and arius proposed that barine should marry dion in the temple of isis and the couple should afterwards be guided through the secret passage to the boat this proposal was approved and serapion promised to reserve the sanctuary for the wedding of the fugitives for a short time after the departure of the procession which was to take place at sunset in return for this service another might perhaps soon be requested from the friend of octavianus who greeted his promise with grateful warmth the priesthood said serapion takes sides with all who are unjustly persecuted and in this case bestows aid the more willingly on account of its great anxiety to guard the queen from an act which would be difficult to approve as for the fugitives so far as he could see only two possibilities were open to them cleopatra would cleave to mark antony and go would that the immortals might avert it to ruin or she would sacrifice him and save her throne and life in both cases the endangered lovers could soon return uninjured the queen had a merciful heart and never retained anger long if no guilt existed the details of the plan were then settled by archibius anukis and berenike who was with the family of arius and the decision was communicated to the architect archibius had maintained the same silence concerning the destination of the fugitives towards the men composing the council and barine's mother as to his sister with regard to the mission of timagenes and the political questions which occupied his mind he gave charmian only the degree of information necessary to explain the plan she so lovingly promoted but she had no desire to know more on the way home her mind was wholly absorbed by the fear that cleopatra had missed her services and discovered barine's flight true she mentioned the queen's desire to place her children in archibius's charge but she could not give him full particulars until she reached her own apartments her absence had not been noticed the regent mardion had received the procession in the queen's name for cleopatra had driven into the city no one knew where charmian entered her apartments with a lighter heart anukis opened the door to them she had remained undisturbed and it was a pleasure to archibius to give the faithful clever freedwoman an account of the matter with his own lips he could have bestowed no richer reward upon the modest servant who listened to his words as if they were a revelation 
when she disclaimed the thanks with which he concluded protesting that she was the person under obligation the expression was sincere her keen intellect instantly recognized the aristocrat's manner of addressing an equal or an inferior and he who in her eyes was the first of men had described the course of events as though she had stood on the same level the queen herself might have been satisfied with the report when she left charmian's rooms to join the other servants she told herself that she was an especially favoured mortal and when a young cook teased her about her head being sunk between her shoulders she answered laughing my shoulders have grown so high because i shrug them so often at the fools who jeer at me and yet are not half so happy and grateful charmian sorely wearied had flung herself into an armchair and archibius took his place opposite to her they were happy in each other's society even when silent but to-day the hearts of both were so full that they fared like those who are so worn out by fatigue that they cannot sleep how much they had to tell each other yet it was long ere charmian broke the silence and returned to the subject of the queen's wish describing to her brother cleopatra's visit to the house which the children had built how kind and cordial she had been yet a few minutes later incensed by the mere mention of barine's name she had dismissed her so ungraciously i do not know what you intend she said in conclusion but notwithstanding my love for her i must perhaps decide in favour of what is most difficult for when she learns that it was i who withdrew the daughter of leonax from her and the base alexis what treatment can i expect especially as iris no longer gives me the same affection and shows that she has forgotten my love and care this will increase and the worst of the matter is that if the queen begins to favour her i cannot justly reproach her for iris is keener witted and has a more active brain statecraft was always odious to me iris on the contrary is delighted with the opportunity to speak on subjects connected with the government of the country and especially the ceaseless momentous game with rome and the men who guide her destiny that game is lost archibius broke in with so much earnestness that charmian started repeating in a low timid tone lost for ever said archibius unless the olympians be praised that there is still a doubt unless cleopatra can decide to commit an act which will force her to be faithless to herself and destroy her noble image through all future generations how whenever you learn it will be too soon and suppose she should do it archibius you are her most trusted confidant she will place in your charge what she loves more than she does herself more you mean i suppose the children the children yes a hundred times yes she loves them better than aught else on earth for them believe me she would be ready to go to her death let us hope so and you were she to commit the horrible deed i can only suspect what it is but should she descend from the height which she has hitherto occupied would you still be ready with me he interrupted quietly what she does or does not do matters nothing she is unhappy and will be plunged deeper and deeper into misery i know this and it constrains me to exert my utmost powers in her service i am hers as the hermit consecrated to serapis belongs to the god his every thought must be devoted to him to the deity who created him he dedicates body and soul until the death to which he dooms him the bonds which unite me to this woman you know their origin are not less indestructible whatever she desires whose fulfilment will not force me to despise myself is granted in advance she will never require such things from the friend of her childhood cried charmian then approaching him with both arms extended joyfully she exclaimed thus you ought to speak and feel and therein is the answer to the question which has agitated my soul since yesterday barine's flight the favour and disfavour of cleopatra iris my poor head which abhors politics while at this time the queen needs keen-sighted confidants by no means 
her brother interrupted it is for men alone to give counsel in these matters a curse be women's gossip over their toilet tables it is already scattered to the four winds many a well-considered plan of the wisest heads and an iris could never be more fatal to statecraft than just at the present moment had not fate already uttered the final verdict then hence with these scruples cried charmian eagerly my doubts are at an end as usual you point out the right path i had thought of returning to the country estate which we call irenia the abode of peace or to our beloved little palace at canopus to spend the years which may still be allotted to me and return to everything that made my childhood beautiful the philosophers the flowers in the garden the poets even the new roman ones of whose works timogenes sent us such charming specimens would enliven the solitude the child the daughter of the man whose love i renounced and afterwards perhaps her sons and daughters would fill the place of my own as they would have been dear to leonax i too would have loved them this is the guise in which the future has appeared to me in many a quiet hour but shall charmian who when her heart throbbed still more warmly and life lay fair before her laid her first love upon the altar of sacrifice for her royal playfellow abandon cleopatra in misfortune from mere selfish scruples no no like you i too belong come what may to the queen she gazed into her brother's face sure of his approval but waving his uplifted hand he answered gravely no charmian what i a man can assume might be fatal to you a woman the present is not sweet enough for me to embitter it with wormwood from the future and yet you must cast one glance into its gloomy domain in order to understand me you can be silent and what you now learn will be a secret between us only one thing here he lowered the loud tones of his deep voice only one thing can save her the murder of antony or an act of shameless treachery which would deliver him into octavianus's power this is the proposal timogenes brought this she asked in a hollow tone her grey head drooping this he repeated firmly and if she succumbs to the temptation she will be faithless to the love which has coursed through her whole life as the nile flows through the land of her ancestors then charmian stay stay under any circumstances cling to her more firmly than ever for then then my sister she will be more wretched ten a hundredfold more wretched than if octavianus deprives her of everything perhaps even life itself nor will i leave her come what may i will remain at her side until the end cried charmian eagerly but archibius without noticing the enthusiastic ardour so unusual to his sister's quiet nature calmly continued she won your heart also and it seems impossible for you to desert her many have shared our feelings and it is no disgrace to any one misfortune is a weapon which cleaves base natures like a sword yet like a hammer welds noble ones more closely to you therefore it now seems doubly difficult to leave her but you need love the right to live and guard yourself from the most pitiable retrogression is your due as much as that of the rare woman on the throne so long as you are sure of her love remain with her and show your devotion in every situation until the end but the motives which were drawing you away to books flowers and children weigh heavily in the balance and if you lack the anchor of her favour and love i shall see you perish miserably the frost emanating from cleopatra if her heart grew cold to you the pin-pricks with which iris would assail you were you defenceless would kill you this must not be sister we will guard against it do not interrupt me the counsel i advise you to follow has been duly weighed if you see that the queen still loves you as in former days cling to her but should you learn the contrary bid her farewell to-morrow my arenia is yours but she does love me and even should she no longer the test is at hand we will leave the decision to her you shall confess that you were the culprit who aided barine to escape her power to punish archibius if you did not a series of falsehoods must ensue 
try whether the petty qualities in her nature which urged her to commit the fate of leonax's daughter to unworthy hands are more powerful than the nobler ones try whether she is worthy of the self-sacrificing fidelity which you have given her all your life if she remains the same as before spite of this admission here he was interrupted by anukis who asked if her mistress would see iris at this late hour admit her replied archibius after hastily exchanging glances with his sister whose face had paled at his demand he perceived it and as the servant withdrew he clasped her hand saying with earnest affection i gave you my opinion but at our age we must take counsel with ourselves and you will find the right path i have already found it she answered softly with downcast eyes this visitor brought a speedy decision i must not feel ashamed in iris's presence she had scarcely finished speaking when the queen's younger confidant entered she was excited and after casting a searching glance around the familiar room she asked after a curt greeting no one knows where the queen is gone mardian received the procession in her place did she take you into her confidence charmian answered in the negative and inquired whether antony had arrived and how she had found him in a pitiable state was the reply i hastened hither to prevent the queen from visiting him if possible she would have received a rebuff it is horrible the disappointment of peritonium is added to the other burdens observed archibius a feather compared with the rest cried iris indignantly what a spectacle a shrivelled soul never too large in the body of a powerful giant disaster crushes the courage of the descendant of heracles the weakling will drag the queen's splendid courage with him into the dust we will do our best to prevent it replied archibius firmly the immortals have placed you and charmian at her side to sustain her if her own strength fails the time to test your powers has arrived i know my duty replied iris austerely prove it said archibius earnestly you think you have cause for anger against charmian whoever treats my foes so tenderly can doubtless dispense with my affection where is your ward that you shall learn later replied charmian advancing but when you do know you will have still better reason to doubt my love yet it was only to save one dear to me from misery certainly not to grieve you that i stepped between you and barine and now let me say had you wounded me to the quick and everything dear to the greek heart call to me for vengeance i should impose upon myself whatever constraint might be necessary to deny the impulse because this breast contains a love stronger more powerful than the fiercest hate and this love we both share hate me strive to wound and injure one at whose side you have hitherto stood like a daughter but beware of robbing me of the strength and freedom which i need to be and to offer to my royal mistress all the assistance in my power i have just been consulting my brother about leaving cleopatra's service now i was broken vehemently no no not that it must not be she cannot spare you now more easily perhaps than you replied charmian yet in many things my services might be hard to replace nothing under the sun could do it cried iris eagerly if in these days of trouble she should lose you too still darker ones are approaching interrupted archibius positively perhaps you will learn all to-morrow whether charmian yields to her desire for rest or continues in the service of the queen depends on you if you wish her to remain you must not render it too hard for her to do so we three my child are perhaps the only persons at this court to whom the queen's happiness is more than their own and therefore we should permit no incident whatever name it may bear to cloud our harmony iris threw back her head with angry pride exclaiming passionately was it i who injured you i do not know in what respect but you and charmian though you have so long been aware that this heart was closed against every love save one stepped between me and the man for whom i have yearned since childhood and built the bridge which united dion and barine i held the woman i hated in my grasp and thanked the immortals for the boon but you too it is not difficult to guess the secret you are still trying to keep from me you aided her to escape 
you have robbed me of my revenge you have again placed the singer in the path where she must find the man to whom i have a better and older claim and who perhaps may still be considering which of us two will be the better mistress of his house if alexis and his worthy brother do not arrange matters so that we must both content ourselves with thinking tenderly of a dead man that is why i believe that i am no longer indebted to you that charmian has more than repaid herself for all the kindness she has ever showed me with these words she hurried to the door but paused on the threshold exclaiming this is the state of affairs yet i am ready to serve the queen hand in hand with you as before for you too as i have said are necessary to her in other respects i shall follow my own path End of chapter sixteen